Hi there, it is Dan Kerr's DK Analytics. It is October 1st, 2018. We're coming back to you in the video format uh, on the heels of a video last week where we focused on the political challenges juxtaposed against bubble valuations. And we're going to drill down a bit here uh, in this video on the financial and economic challenges. Uh, juxtaposed against bubble asset valuations. Also last week, I uh, put out a, a post, post 47, which uh, both of this video and the one last week referenced to varying degrees. The title of that post was with rising interest rates, if you must buy, purchase value versus growth and then sell. Uh, this post has a lot to do with interest rate sensitivity of value stocks in contrast with growth stocks and the value stocks being considerably less vulnerable to downside pressure from rising interest slash discount rates. Neither are, are uh, to be recommended in a landscape of dramatically rising interest rates, but if you have to be invested then better to be in value stocks uh, than growth. And again, uh, for those people that purchase stocks uh, at a fraction of current uh, prices that have locked in, thanks to EPS growth or dividend growth, extremely low PEs or extremely high dividend yields, those people are best placed or best uh, uh, advised to stay put, right? I, I made a comparison somewhere if you bought a house uh, for, you know, say $40,000 uh, back where I grew up in Niskayuna, New York, and they're now worth $250,000 or $300,000, you don't sell because you've already got what you're looking for. That is a cheap purchase price compared to the rental value, in our case, and the value of stocks, or if you bought attractive bonds, which are now no longer out there, then you have the same um, opportunity to stay put. But with stocks, that is a greater um, possibility because many of the stock or the bonds that yielded so much in, in decades prior have since been retired. And stocks, obviously, unless they go bankrupt, don't retire. Let me, uh, or allow me a brief addendum to uh, the political aspects of last week's video. Again, politics juxtaposed against bubble valuations. And I kind of dance around this a bit, but let me state it very directly. The biggest rub of the whole Kavanaugh nomination circus, the charade, is the following. In today's world, much like in all communist and other tyrannical regimes, whether they're fascist, communist, they're all collectivists, I call it the Borg, as you might recall, uh, we're swapping the assumed innocent, quote unquote, with guilty until proven otherwise, quote unquote. This is a very, very dangerous precedent for the most obvious of reasons, and it threatens the underpinnings of due process rights and our entire legal system, which have long, all right, our due process rights are slash our legal system, which have long enabled freedom, tolerance, societal equity before the law, happiness, and the greatest amount of wealth for the greatest amount of people. And speaking in geopolitical terms, uh, we also, in the realm of politics, face uh, on, a geo, on, a, on a global basis, face a global trade war that continues to ramp up in its threats. Uh, and we also recently see America, American threats to try to isolate Russia and its fossil fuel exports to Europe. The neocons uh, are in too much control of, of Donald Trump's cabinet, unfortunately. But this is an entirely ridiculous and very dangerous proposition. It's also ludicrous both from a U.S. oil and natural gas export capability, especially natural gas, not even possible. Uh, and it's also ludicrous from a geographical slash military perspective with Russia being right next door to Europe. Uh, 
America has no chance of, 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 of achieving its will here. It doesn't have the goods, doesn't have the oil or especially the natural gas and the kind of quantity and price that Europe needs. And it certainly cannot defend against Russia's uh, geographical landmass presence that uh, ties right into the European continent. So, but these kind of things, globally stated in the political realm, are very dangerous and unsettling. And again, we refer to this given our bubble asset valuations. Well, what could go wrong? Speaking of drilling down into the financial and economic dimensions of this, and they all are interconnected, obviously. Uh, allow me a big picture summary. We have U.S. bonds and OECD bonds in bubbles. We have a U.S. stock market in a tremendous bubble. The S&P 500 has outperformed the rest of the world by a country mile for about one and a half years, in effect, since Trump got elected president. Global and U and U.S. debt are off the charts. Global debt and U.S. debt off the charts. And we have a very fragile, debt-enabled, misallocation plague, falling productivity, economic recovery, quote-unquote, that's very long in the tooth. And by the way, the reason we have this massive increase in debt, which far outstrips uh, global GDP growth, is because we have collapsing productivity growth. If we had stout or invigorated increasing productivity statistics, then we wouldn't be incurring all this debt. So that hopefully makes a lot of sense. Let me now shift to some particulars or things to ponder of more a particular than a big picture nature or part of this big picture, the trees and the forest, if you will. And, and again, contrast this with valuations that are an utter disconnect with political and, as we're now going to go through, financial and economic reality. Not that you don't know it, but perhaps it's worth repeating some of these and making a mental note of it and then taking a look at how exposed you are uh, with stocks uh, or bonds that have been purchased relatively recently. Interestingly, and consistent with past experience, I've been in the business for three or four decades, uh, it's not different this time around, but most analysts and nearly all economists remain wildly bullish. In fact, recent economist uh, consensus, there were 11 bank economists, they, they all took their estimates for 19 growth, and on average, they came out at an astounding nearly 4%. And the analysts uh, calculating uh, nice EPS residual growth are also uh, remain very bullish and, and are looking into, again, double digit growth extending into 19, which I continue to think is, is, is total, uh, totally ridiculous or disconnected from reality. More particulars to ponder amidst our valuation disconnect rising interest rates, albeit from historically low to unheard of, unprecedented, even negative levels. When you compare this with nearly $250 trillion in global debt, in which a 1% higher borrowing cost would, if all the debt had to be financed within the, refinanced within the constraint of a year, would amount to two and a half trillion dollars in higher interest expense, or about 3% of global GDP in aggregate within about six years. That is, the refinancing would take globally roughly six years to complete. Um, and this doesn't include the additional new debt that we're piling on at 10 to 15 trillion per annum, all right, that it will all be at the higher level of interest, assuming we continue to have rising global bond interest rates. The U.S. benchmark interest rate, the world benchmark interest rate, other than for the LIBOR, uh, is obviously the 10-year treasury. And interestingly, 
and you, you might be aware of this, it's up 170 basis points or 1.7 percentage points from July of 16. So in a bit more than two years, it went from a bit under 1.4% the yield did, uh, the cost of money, if you will, or capital, uh, to almost 3.1%. Now, that 170 basis points uptick with much of the world's borrowing costs tied to the dollar and by extension to a 10 and lesser degree of 30 year treasury, uh, with this the fact and a buck still accounting for the vast majority of global trade and currency reserves, although declining, uh, this has a huge global impact, that is US monetary tightening does. And it obviously very, very much includes emerging market economies that feature plummeting earnings, I'm sorry, plummeting currencies, currencies which make uh, the repayment in dollars, much less the servicing of debt that's, uh, whose interest rate is rising, almost unpayable, unbearable. Um, if one, in fact, took those 170 basis points or 1.7 uh, percentage point increase in the benchmark yield for much of the world in a bit over two years, that suggests when it all, when the entire refinancing is done and assuming no more interest rate increase, right, beyond the current benchmark, say 3.1%, um, about $4.3 trillion in additional global interest expense that should manifest itself, given that this has been going on for two years, within about another four. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full equivalent of 5% of global GDP in higher financing costs. And yet we still have an abnormally low or record low borrowing costs in most OECD nations. More uh, looking at some trees amidst this troubling forest. In the U.S., record high consumer confidence is set against, this is kind of typical, uh, record high U.S. consumer debt, near record low U.S. savings, which the Fed and the government statisticians doubled uh, because it was too low for the second time in about 20 years. We have some 95 million Americans of working age that remain out of the workforce. Most jobs are low wage, part time, without any benefits. We have an unemployment rate in the US of well north of 20% if we still use the definition that was uh, in use prior to Bill Clinton's reelection attempt uh, back in the 90s. We have declining house sales and we have falling car sales. In the meantime, we have rising write-offs on credit card debt in the U.S. and in other nations. We also have weakening real U.S. and emerging market consumption rates when adjusted for inflation, which is raging in emerging markets and picking up smartly in the U.S. We have rising corporate default rates in the U.S. and particularly in emerging markets. And the emerging market nations are, in, in a quite a few instances, on the brink of either defaulting and or having to seek IMF assistance. Whether this is Venezuela, Argentina, uh, Turkey, Indonesia, South Africa, it's widespread and it's global. Not exactly a picture of robust global economic health, especially if one considers that emerging markets comprise roughly 50% of global GDP, at least in, in uh, purchasing power terms. We also face strongly rising private and public sector debts, again, amidst falling productivity growth, which explains why we're adding debt because we don't have the productivity to sustain growth with internally generated funds. Um, and we're facing outright productivity declines in, in, in nations and in industries. We also face aggregate American financing needs, that is 
public, private, individual, right? Corporate, public, corporate, and in, at the individual level, there's $69 trillion in aggregate U.S. debt and about two to two and a half trillion in new debt year after year. Fred has this statistic. I referenced it in a couple of posts. But we're America, just America, is adding two to two and a half trillion in new debt. And the Fed is ramped up to be selling $600 billion in bonds, treasuries, and Freddie paper. Who will buy all this debt? And at what price? Obviously, if you sell this much at some point, the price is going to fall, and that is in the bond, and the interest rates are going to rise. We also are in a global economic landscape that features, despite plummeting uh, out, uh, emerging market strength, vitality, whether it's uh, growth or obviously the markets, bonds, stocks, or the currencies, we face a supply restriction uh, strengthened or determined oil price surge, which is obviously also being fanned by increasing political instability in the Mideast, but it preceded this. We have such a stout increase in oil prices uh, that, in fact, especially for emerging markets and collapsing currencies, remember oil is priced in dollars, uh, we are seeing that as a big roadblock uh, to growth in the emerging world to a major degree and to a lesser degree in OECD countries. But it's now eclipsed in numerous emerging world nations, including India, the 08 surge in oil prices up to nearly $150 a barrel. We also in this uh, landscape on the financial side, see record stock repurchases in the United States at, yes, bubble PEs. In fact, about one trillion should be purchased this year, uh, fueled obviously by tax or reduction, by profit repatriation from overseas, by low borrowing costs, um, and that one trillion a year uh, is uh, in stock buybacks that are likely is the rough equivalent of earnings. Uh, why am I saying this? And so much for reinvesting earnings, uh, which is an accounting fiction, but let's go with it for the sake of this, in growth in capital spending. As always, the C-suite majors not in CapEx binge or growth or organic growth binge, but in quasi-public LBOs that goose the stock price and the value of their huge, huge uh, stock options packages. It's just like in 04 with the repatriation. It's just the same story repeating, sadly. Staying with the C-suite for a second in the United States, the stock buybacks that are occurring at bloated PEs are often a good contrarian indicator of a stock market topping up. It happened in 07 and 08. And just like then, I, I can assure you, given the $3 trillion plus expansion in corporate debt over the past 10 years, that it's going to be followed when the stock market collapses, stock prices come down by, you guessed it, dilutive secondary stock offerings at a fraction of erstwhile bubble prices that we're seeing today. Standard Poor's 500 earnings per share comparisons are going to begin cycling lower tax rates, huge profit repatriation, and the associated stock buyback push, financial engineering, that has given us the double digit EPS growth. And this should happen by the first quarter or begin to happen in Q1 19. This is often brushed aside and extended into the future and I'm guilty of the same, but we have an overdue recession after a money printing, debt laced, productivity waning, they're tied at the hip, weak recovery of nearly record or record length, which is in the cards. Recessions, as you might well know, pummel 
EPS residuals. Residual meaning top line is 100. The earnings are between 5 and 8%. And they get clocked. They tend to fall in half. And then they expand by 100% on the upside. So 1% or 2% negative real GDP growth will have earnings per share decline 40 50%. This time it could be worse, potentially a lot worse, given the situation we're in politically, financially, and economically. If that wasn't enough reason for concern, a, a tree, actually a redwood, a sequoia, in terms of how giant it is in determining our entire forest, our global forest, there is a gathering, tit for tat, trade war threat heating up between the US and China. China has walked away for now. Trump will double down, believing this is a sign of Chinese weakness or possible capitulation. He will prove to be wrong, and this is probably going to escalate, which is very, very dangerous for global economic growth and potentially trade wars becoming hot wars. Yet, a little bit of a drum roll here. The S&P 500 is trading at 25 times bloated financially engineered EPS and the Russell 2000 at nearly 60 times earnings. If earnings get cut in half just for, for flavor and the S&P trades where it is today, we're looking at a P of 50, not sustainable. And we haven't gone into the effect that higher discount rates based off of higher interest rates will have on net present value, today's value of those future earnings. It, it really is out there in, in, in outer space uh, valuation wise. So what could possibly go wrong with a cheery consensus of our economist, uh, star economists at 11 leading investment banks or the analysts, the, the, the sell side analysts that have never seen a stock that they don't want to promote for investment banking reasons and, and so on. But does this remind anyone that's been around for a while of 2007, 2008, except a lot worse? 16 trillion fatter central bank balance sheets worse, 75 trillion more global debt worse, 446 trillion of over-the-counter off-balance sheet interest rate sensitive derivatives that are exposed to still record low OECD nation interest rates as emerging market bonds, stocks, and currencies blow up one after the other. The contagion threat could easily spread to OECD peripheral countries, uh, including Italy, for political reasons and posturing reasons, but still, and eventually to the OECD core, which is why Germany a while back, two, three weeks ago or a month ago, uh, was considering looking at bailing out Turkey to avoid this whole thing uh, blowing over into Central and Western Europe. And by extension, what will happen to uh, our world, our valuations when the global central banks led by the 800 pound gorilla the fed will have to revisit easing easing monetary easing instead of tightening uh, this means the fed will have to reduce the fed funds rate and i believe it will have to print record amounts of money don't forget its owners of the banks whose balance sheets are going to be exposed to all those collapsing debt emerging market uh, valuations being cut uh, in half in terms of bonds spreading to the core. Uh, my, my question here is, yours should be, will in such a world government bonds, when we have the Fed finally telling us there is no escape from monetary debasement, will government bonds remain a safe haven for that reason and for the ever-growing solvency risks, which again, force printing because there is no other way to do it within our economic corset, what I often term our public policy stew, which is so poisonous. Um, when central banks unleash the next easing round led by the Fed, 
will they be able to control an unparalleled creditor constituency that accompanies nearly 250 trillion in global debt, which is more than three times global economic output? No, they won't because the, the tail are the central banks and they have a put, but the dog is definitely creditors with 250 trillion in the game that are either going to get hit by insolvency and or inflation or both kinds of developments. So they will demand, you guessed it, higher interest rates and we know where bonds will go and by extension we know where stocks will go. And all this is before a recession which will likely take earnings down by 40, 50 percent, perhaps substantially more this time around. So what kind of losses are bond and equity holders staring at in OECD nations? I'd say for a very stark and admittedly crass preview, consider today's emerging bond, stock, and currency markets. Now let me close by offering you some charts that tie into this that I hope you find of interest. Let me start with a trade chart and make this as a, as a preface or as a, a remark prior to looking at the chart. In a debt-laced world, increasingly lacking income to service on parallel debt, rising protectionism is an acute economic growth threat. Here in the U.S., think of global car or aerospace industries where U.S. producers paying high wages to their workers have huge foreign content in their finished products that they won't be able to access or will have to pay much for. And consumers are strapped in terms of their purchasing power. So very negative. Uh, for long-term um, insight into this, let me see if I can show you this chart. And this goes through a period where we had, obviously, Smoot-Hawley. We had the Hoover situation. This chart here shows us the duties, U.S. duties collected as a percent of total imports. We know what Smoot-Hawley brought. And we've been going down, 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 and the global economy has been growing uh, as a result for a long period of time into about here. But now we've got this. We've got the Trump tariffs, right? We've got the Trump tariffs. So the question is, with our extremely low productivity, debt-laced, income-lacking global world, global economy, how much of this can we stand? I would argue a lot less than before, which makes this so dangerous or acute. Let me shift to something that I went through in post number 47. And this is very important, and it goes beyond value and growth stocks. It goes uh, to the heart of how stocks are valued in uh, their entirety. That is, bonds and stocks travel together. And an earnings yield is nothing other than a, an inverse PE, a P flipped on its head. Right. For example, an EP, which is an earnings yield, earnings divided by price of 14, is a PE of 7. Earnings yields go up with bond yields. That is, stock prices go down with bond prices. So earnings yields go up, the stock prices go down, and bond prices go down as bond yields go up. They travel in tandem and they're valued according to interest rates, that is, stocks are, right? And obviously bonds as well. But they really travel together. And let me show you this here in this fantastic Yardini chart. The only shortcoming, let me get this on board here, is, is the fact that uh, Yardini and Co., as of 88, way back here, decided that they no longer had to look at recurring uh, restructuring charges, that is, and continuing business lines. I'm, I'm getting into the weeds. Let me show you this. And this, this trend here through the 70s, where you've had earnings yields go way up, um, 
that actually led earnings yields way up, PEs way down, led this blue line, led the red line, which are 10 year bond yields, all right, 10 year treasuries. But the two travel together. My point here is we're at near record low interest rates. We have very questionable earnings staying power, low quality earnings growth, financially engineered. And this could unwind again to give us a bear market in bonds and stocks travel together in tandem and valuations that result in stocks that sell for six, seven times earnings and have an earnings yield of 14, 15% and a dividend yield of probably over 10, all right? Last but not least, in a world in which we can depend upon uh, the central banks to continue to print money because we're not going to have a return to greater rule of law, to greater property right protections until we absolutely have to. So what does that mean? It means that ultimately currency debasement will color bond valuations and then by extension stocks, because bonds are nothing other than currency promises. And if a currency promise is associated with increasing default or insolvency risks, our rapidly rising debt at all levels, private, public, pension, the pension bailouts in the US, just the state level pensions are $6 trillion underfunded, all right? The whole globe, you've heard that the US in aggregate is 200 trillion dollars unfunded that is the u.s government compared to the present value of its medicare and social security and veterans benefits but we're in a world where my point is that if we don't get back to better constitutional adherence and property right protections and sound money which we won't until it's too late then we will have to revisit the only game in town that fiat money central bankers know and love, and that is printing more money and lowering interest rates. But this time around, it will become apparent to anyone with a memory that there is no escape from currency debasement purgatory. So you need to flee from paper assets. That flight from paper assets will inevitably, I think, lead us into a commodity bull run, which will at first be shattered by ramping or increasing global economic weakness. That's a given that might well happen. Oil has resisted this because it's an even bigger scarcity story. I think ag and oil, I keep saying, those are the two you want to have above anything else after physical precious metals in your possession, which are commodity and money. So you get the a double hit in a positive sense, exposure wise. But let's consider this in relative terms. If stocks are overvalued relative to commodities, then even if we have a decline in commodities, they should fall less in relative terms than stocks if we do in fact enter a world of unparalleled monetary debasement which I believe for all the reasons stated is around the corner and which will be precipitated by a spreading contagion from emerging markets that cannot afford to pay the, the interest rates in dollars and their weakening currencies and their hugely rising costs of capital. So this whole thing has only one answer. It's like a sick patient. You don't get at the cure. You just put on another Band-Aid, take another aspirin. And in our case, it's not aspirin. But it's like Fisher said, it's financial cocaine. And what's going to happen, and this is the last slide, to relative, and I believe over time, absolute values, relative shot, courtesy of uh, Casey Research that you would like to perhaps look at. You can get it for yourself off the web right now, right? This suggests, and, and I keep stating this in bonds and stocks, we don't have reversion to the mean, but beyond the mean. And that's human nature, that's boom bust, that's manic depressive. So we're 
in a world where as soon as they open the monetary easing spigot in, in, in money printing and where they can in interest rates, the U.S. and a few other nations, we will likely be off to the races in a switch in relative outperformance between stocks here, the S&P 500, and a broader basket of commodities, which instead of going down relative to stocks, should start going up. And this cycle here is back over 40, 50 years. And by the way, this whole cycle is very interesting, happens to be closely tied to when America took the dollar fully off of the gold standard and we ended up in global fiat money and the rest is history so there's some food for thought hope it makes some sense hope you can use it in your in your allocation thoughts especially for those that have stocks that they bought at relatively high prices relatively recently 20, 30, 40 years ago, solid companies, no worry, you've already got the low PE and high dividend yield, so you're all set to absorb this, just like the person that bought the house for 40000 and houses are worth 300 you don't sell it uh, and hope to get back into a $40,000 house. Uh, if you like this and you're so inclined uh, uh, to spread the word, we would be very grateful the more hits we get the better our chances of reaching a sustainable business model are. And we've been at it for three years, so I don't say that lightly, and we'll keep on trucking as, as well as we can. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Dan Kurz, DK Analytics. It is October 1st, 2018. Over and out. Bye-bye.